All right, let me let me start with this. How many how many of you guys have not seen Hamilton? Okay, one, two. Oh, Janelle's not seen it. I thought in the minutes. back room, right? <laughs> Silly has not seen it. Okay, this will help me contextualize what I'm I'm going to say. Um, I will say this before before watching this. American history was almost dead to me. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right, Ashley, <laughs> Ashley and I are falling on the floor. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm a classical studies student, but I did it for language, not for history. My history classes I suffered through, my language classes I loved. Um, but watching this, actually, like, I mean, it's it, this is the thing, right? When you have a great history teacher, you're you're like, wow, history is amazing. <laughs> and a boring teacher, you're like, this is why I hate history. <laughs> This was one of those things that made history come come alive for me. So this is the story of, of um, Hamilton, the person on the, well, I'll talk about him in a minute. All of this, this entire thing put together by Lin-Manuel Miranda, I'll show you his picture in a minute, was stolen from this book by Ron Chernow named Alexander Hamilton. It is an 800 page chunker on history. I'm listening to it, but if I remember, it was like 8,000 hours on Audible. Oh yeah. uh, so I'm not super far into it. <clears throat> but he writes even, even this book as, as a novel, which is a really cool idea, like reading through someone's That's a sleeper. That's a sleeper. <laughs> That's a sleeper. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Hamilton on the right, Lin-Manuel Miranda on the left. Uh, this is a Broadway production, and so... You know, the pictures, most, almost every single picture I, show, I, I will show today in one video is the OBC, the original Broadway cast. Uh, and if you listen to it on Spotify, that's the OBC singing it as well, the original Broadway cast. Uh, but because it's on Broadway and because the OBC isn't performing it any longer, as I know, there's different casts, there's different pictures and things like that. Um, but the cool thing about Hamilton, if you didn't know, like he, he's the guy on the $10 bill. So... It, this this is what's so the ten dollar founding father without a father. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is what's so cool about history. This is what's so cool about the story itself. Like, I'll, I'll tell you one lesson that I learned from this was how important the seemingly obscurious really the, uh, the the things that operate in obscurity really are. And, and that's a theme of the whole entire production as well. Is like these orphans. Even in the second song, Andrew Burr, when, when Hamilton remembers that uh, Andrew Burr is uh, an orphan, there's this sort of idea that like we were the ones outcast. And, and this, this idea that like we know every other founding father, but can we tell the story of Hamilton? And so that's what that's what this production is about, is how do we resurrect someone's story who's not there and bring to light some things that have been done? Uh, I mentioned before, <clears throat> it, it is on Broadway. Uh, unfortunately, Broadway, as you know, is closed. <clears throat> but I'm definitely on their list for when it opens back up to be the first to be notified that my wife and I can go there for a date weekend. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> I learned so much, not just from the content, <clears throat> but even from the way that it was put together. Uh, speaking of people who operate in obscurity, this is one of those things that made me realize how important the people behind the scenes for something truly are. The stage design of this production is out of this world. This is it. Like, that's the entire stage that they have. And the way that they control the objects on the stage and the lighting that I'll talk about in a minute to create something creative and beautiful is so informative. The whole entire middle of the structure is, is a giant rotating platform. There's two rotating platforms. So one can be spinning clockwise and one can be spinning counterclockwise. So people on the edges are moving while nothing else is moving in the scene. And, and the way that they use that to creatively draw people together and then pull people apart from the stage and how Disney, when they decided to work with Lin-Manuel Miranda to produce it for Disney Plus, like it was only three takes, that's it. And there's only one What's it called when there's like a discontinuity in a movie where somebody has this hair is down and then the next scene they forgot it's up. Forget what else called. Continuity error. Yeah, con there's only one continuity error, and it's because her her flower fell off mm. at one point. Um, and I, I haven't even seen it visually, and I've seen it multiple times now. Uh, to 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 remember that the people who work on things behind the scene are so critical to the stories that we create. It's the same thing for me even with the lighting crew, uh, like. 
I'm not a stage person. I, I'm not a, what, what is the word for? Stagehand. Yeah, stage but what's, hand, what's, stage what's the strange English word that we use for people who are in drama? Thespian? Uh, Thespian, yes. <laughs> I am strange not. English. I am not. <laughs> that's the kind of <laughs> thing, okay? That is a strange English word. Let's we'll just put it that way. Um, I, I'm, I don't have stage background. I don't have drama background. And so when when I saw this production and saw how they used lighting to accomplish things, I was blown away. One of my favorite scenes when it comes to lighting is when uh, Hamilton's son dies. It's this amazing moment where like you, you're hearing his heart beat with like the kick drum and it's like slowing. And then when he finally passes, Hamilton leans his body over his son, slowly over his son's body and the light that's strongly on his son begins to fade as he puts him into darkness. And you don't realize it because the lighting is in just the right way where it's not like awkward, he's like laying over. It's just this like slow thing and his son like slowly fades into darkness right beneath him as his wife is like crying out. Just that, that the way that we can use lighting, the way that we can use mediums to create something creative is such an incredible thing. Uh, another thing I learned just again from the way that the, the whole entire production is put together, uh, the, the just a reminder like Burr wasn't black okay uh, just a reminder George Washington wasn't black either uh, this it's such a diverse cast that they put together for this production and the, the way that Miranda puts it is he, he wants to tell the story of America then told by the, the America of today mm -hmm. And I, I just love that. And there's these, there's these really cool lines throughout the production, even where Angelica says, like, when I meet Thomas Jefferson, I'm going to ask him to invite women to the sequel. Just these really cool lines that remind us that, like, we have this history. There's something really negative about that. And it's something that has produced something really cool in our country as well. But I also learned a ton about just leadership. And that's what today is about. I'm just going to say this, like if you've seen it, there's a trillion other points that you could put together than what I'm choosing. I have seven for you. I have seven thoughts, but there's a million other. I have a whole list of everything that I didn't get to that I would have loved to get to. Mm -hmm. I went through the entire manuscript over two times, word by word, to review every single thing that was spoken and sung in the entire performance to pull out the best of what I thought was most helpful to you guys when we talk about leadership. Some of the other things I did, I don't get to talk about. I love the, the, the stand for not apologizing for what is right. I, I love the, the comments that are made about slavery. If we don't stop it, we aid and abet it. Uh, that's such a great legal term. Uh, when they say your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor, like, oh yeah, you, you're a super wealthy, rich family, country, statesman, blah, blah, blah. It's because all your people who are doing all your work for you, you're not paying them, speaking to the evils of slavery. Um, I love the, the, like, there's this really cool theme of friendship throughout the whole thing. But one of the friends literally says, if this is the end of me, at least I have a friend with me. Um, super cool to see friendship throughout the production. Uh, I love the encouragement that uh, Hamilton gets along the way. There's a lot of pushback from George Washington throughout it. Hamilton's like, I don't want to, I don't want to write. I want to fight. And Washington's like, no, no. And he, and it really frustrates him over time until he finally says like, I know greatness lies in you. And, and he says, there's men waiting in the field for you. Super cool uh, encouragement. And I love, I love this, <laughs> the fight between Hamilton and Burr the whole time where Hamilton tells Burr like, I'd rather be divisive, divisive than indecisive. Uh, I would rather divide people than never stand for anything. Mm -hmm. So the, the production of Hamilton is, is the story of Hamilton's life and leadership. It begins with the very first song that we sung last year at the uh, Fosversary, and it opens with this idea that an, that an orphan and somebody who was cast off went through a really traumatic childhood um, and, and rose up to produce for our country our financial system. Mm -hmm. And even Thomas Jefferson at the very end of the play says, yeah, I didn't like it, but I couldn't destroy it, and I tried. <laughs> it's just this confession that, that he makes. And so, you know, to have somebody, again, who like is on the money that we hand out to people and really not know their story. Uh, that's, that's really the, the heart of Hamilton who tells our story. 
Uh, when we die. So I have seven leadership lessons that I want to share with you guys from Hamilton. And there's going to be a couple of times throughout where I'm going to ask you guys some questions, get some, some engagement as well. Um, but I, I like, if you guys want to say something, if there's some, some cool idea or something that you're noticing, like, please, like, this is just an interactive time. As you guys know, like, I'm coming with some things, but I, I want to create a conversation here and, and uh, vibe off of this. So as we meet Hamilton in the very beginning, we see this guy who's absolutely on fire, go-getter. Uh, my first leadership lesson I learned from Hamilton is that nonstop is never sustainable. Nonstop is never sustainable. Uh, again, we, we meet Hamilton and he is this scrappy young lad who is incredibly ambitious. People say of him, and he says even of himself, uh, there's this, the entire first act is, I'm not throwing away my shot. I get one shot and there's absolutely no way that I am, am throwing that away. And as a result, he, he becomes this nonstop person. He says, uh, even, even in the first song they sing over him, you could never back down. You never learn to take your time because you were so nonstop. How to account for his rise to the top, Burr asks, man, the man is nonstop. Mm -hmm. uh, that's him. And, and so my, my, my first kind of question for you guys is like, you know, this, it's something that we laud in Hamilton, that he was nonstop. And we love the fact that he was so ambitious and such a go-getter. And yet it will be because of that, that a lot of the evil that we see in, in the following points, like this is where it comes from. But our culture praises this. Why are we nonstop? This is a discussion question. What persuades this nonstop lifestyle that we praise in other people or ourselves? And we sort of come to glorify that hustle mentality and we're kind of fed even in a non-spiritual way that as soon as we're born we start dying we only have so much time on the earth and so it, our culture sort of glorifies that chase everything get everything be everything to everyone um, mm. but you only have 24 hours in a day so you got to pack it all in mm. I mean, I think our culture glorifies this idea that you'll have what you're what you want when you're too old to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And so like the people who are older get what they want, but if you're good, you get it, you get what you want when you're young. And that comes from this fact that like you have to unbury all these things that it took your boss to do in 50 years. You have to unbury those things in half the time if you want to have them and enjoy them. Mm. Conversely, uh, I sit under a lot of mindsets and worldviews that would suggest that you know, we and, and even Lancioni and, and the motive would point to this idea like we work hard now so one day we cannot but <laughs> if you start that non-stop lifestyle like that will be your lifestyle forever mm -hmm. um, and then like you said when you're too old to enjoy it it will be gone mm. I was I never thought this, about this till now but like from from the birth of our nation, like the whole idea of America was started by people who said, I'm going to choose not the easy thing, but the hard thing. I'm going to go across the ocean in like two, three months. Some of us are going to die before we get there. And then I'm going to jump into this wilderness and create a life for me. And that is the whole story of our nation. Like, it's a people who said, I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to make my life, make a life happen. I never really thought about it until now, about how it started at the very beginning. I think there's also an argument to be said for as long as people were in these times where it was letter writing and it was all these things and it took time to travel, you had to take time to travel, for word to travel, to communicate with other people, to collaborate. So I think that, you know, there was automatically room left so that by the time that they got to like Independence Hall to write the Declaration of Independence, all that, like they were going, going nonstop because that's the time that they had. They had to make the most of it. And when they left, that was it. They're leaving. It's gone. We got to go. But now that technology is caught up, everybody's always been so focused on 
how do we get it faster, 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 as fast as possible at a moment's notice? No one ever really thought to ask, do we need this? Does it take away the other times that we have to think through things, to stop, to rest, mm. to whatever it is? So I think that that's yeah. always a point to bring up is that they had time built in to think and to process. Wow. We don't. That's so, really good. Yeah, like we've forgotten about the value of the journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a good metaphor there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. I also think like societally, there's this great, like fear of unfulfilled potential. Yes. But potential can often be limitless. And so yes. you're chasing after an end point that consistently mm, moves that you so yourself. Yes. Mm. So Whitney Quill and spaghetti to the wall. So good. So good. Yeah, that's that's Simon Sinek's new book, Infinite Game. Yeah. That's what we play. We play an infinite game. Yeah, I, that has been a strong, strong thought on my heart recently, Whitney. Um, if I can do it, I must. Mm -hmm. I have to. Mm -hmm. I'm not throwing away my shot. So, sometimes a leader willingly throws away their shot for another person. That's <laughs> often, often a leader. That's not a message coming coming out of our society. Um, it's it's the message of Hamilton. It's the I'm, I'm never going to back down. I'm nonstop. Uh, and it's also get out my way, or you're going to suffer for it. And I think about some of the people in my life who I see as this like nonstop, I'm, I'm going and grinding and I'll and, and get out of my way. Uh, I think I, I resonate with some of what, what Hamilton and others about him share later in the performance. Hamilton faces, this is Burr saying, an, up, an endless uphill climb. He has something to prove. Why, why are we nonstop? Because we believe we have something to prove. I'm something, watch me. I'll, pr I'll prove I'm not a loser. I'll prove I'm not a failure. I'll prove that I can do X, Y, Z for my family. And then our family suffers. Later on in the performance, then we could prove that we're worth more than we bargained for. So this is, again, it's like, I have to prove my worth. I have to prove that I, I, can, I can do what others believed I couldn't do. It's really, that's not what ought to persuade us to life or leadership. That's that's not what should be, that's not a healthy motivation for leadership. To, to go back to even what you and I were talking about a couple months ago at uh, BLS. That's not a healthy motivation for leadership. I have read to you guys this quote before from C12. We live in a culture that's trained us to believe that fatigue in business or life or leadership or whatever is normal and even admirable, like a badge of honor that indicates that we're doing something worthwhile. That doesn't mean that some of the things that we're called to in life are going to take like everything out of us and fatigue us tremendously. <laughs> Sometimes that, that, that's what happens with, with life and family and babies and kiddos and sick moms and dads who just got injured. And like, that's, that's fatiguing. And, but that's a choice where we choose to give ourselves away to that. It's not persuaded by this thought that if I don't do this, I'm not this status. I'm not this type of parent. I'm not this type of leader, I'm not this type of business owner. That's a much different mindset. And, and, and when we pursue this nonstop lifestyle, we put ourselves, this is one of the, the lessons as well, into the same exact place that, that Hamilton winds up putting himself. As a result of him being nonstop and not listening to his wife's pleas that we'll get to in a little bit, as he grows his authority, his influence, meets his wife, marries his wife, uh, grows in his statesmanship, his capabilities. Now he's writing and he's leading armies. Eventually he comes to this place of extreme brokenness and loneliness and fatigue. And then he meets Maria Reynolds. <laughs> Maria Reynolds is the person with whom Alexander will commit adultery and move himself into a life of recovery, recovering from this act in his life. Uh, there's nothing like summer in the city. Someone under stress meets someone looking pretty. There's trouble in the air. You can smell it. And Alexander's watched this by himself. I'll let him tell it. I hadn't slept in a week. I was weak. This is the lead up to Andrew meeting Maria Reynolds. What does nonstop cost him? I'm by myself. 
because he wouldn't go with his, his family on vacay or stop or take a break, one of the songs in Hamilton. He's under stress and now he's not sleeping. And so when this woman comes over, I need help. What does he do? He gets up, walks this woman back to her house and winds up being unfaithful to his family. And not just once, multiple times. And as a result, he winds up getting a letter from her husband demanding that Hamilton pay him money to keep this a secret, protect his reputation, and allow him to continue to have an affair with his wife. Eventually, this gets found out. All of our unfaithfulness is eventually found out. Everything always comes to the light. If not in this life, in the next life, all of our unfaithfulness will come to light. And when we see ourselves hiding from the light and enjoying the darkness, that's when we realize something's wrong in my heart because I don't want to go to the light. I don't want to bring this out. I don't want to get this exposed. All of our unfaithfulness is eventually found out. His is found out and people, uh, the other statesmen come to him and say, hey, we know what's going on. And we've seen the financial reports. You've been stealing from our government to pay money for uh, putting your affair out of, out of publicity. And he clarifies, no, 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 no. It wasn't the government's money. It was my money. I've got a paper trail to prove it. And they're like, oh, dang it. And they walk out. And it's kind of this idea of like, you got to keep my story a secret. And Bert kind of turns and he just says, rumors grow and closes the door. And as a result of this fear and this like, how am I going to protect myself? This is where the, the Reynolds pamphlet comes from. This is a real thing that was written where uh, he detailed the entire episodes of his unfaithfulness and his affair, pub, like printed it, publicized it, put it out to the world. Who gets one? His wife. And his wife learns of the affair through this written paper. Uh, it's a, it, then they sing the song, Burn. And I will go over some of those words in, in just a minute. But throughout the entire performance, this idea of being nonstop is, is a common theme. Burr hates Hamilton for the fact that he's so nonstop because he's the one rising to the top. But I love this quote because George Washington in the performance is, is definitely one of the heroes of, of the production. And I, I love his position on this idea of being nonstop. He says at one point, let's take a stand with the stamina that God has granted us. That's such a, that's such a different mindset. Like, mm -hmm. what's, what's the stamina? What's the pace that God's given us? Not other people. This is where Burr's jealousy of Hamilton comes from. Wish I was like this guy. Why does he keep getting everything? He's the one who... And George Washington saying, let's, let's, let's take a stand with the stamina that God's given us. And similarly, Eliza Hamilton, Hamilton's wife, she's got a very different perspective as well. As well. She actually says to Hamilton at one point, she says, if you take your time, you will make your mark. And her common refrain throughout the whole production is look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. Her, her perspective, like that's what she's encouraging Hamilton to do. If you take your time, you'll make your mark, which is exactly what Hamilton wants the whole time. How, how, how do I do this? How do I rise to the top? And so my question, my challenge question for you on this is, what's the pace that you're called to? Michael Todd, we've been studying him uh, over the past two years since, since GLS, um, calls it the pace of grace. The pace of grace. What's, what's the pace of grace, you know, just to understand, and I, this has been so helpful to me over the past couple of years, just realizing like my pace that I'm called to is not someone else's pace. And it is that jealousy and that comparison by which we find ourselves so discontent with our own calling. That's precisely not what God wants. Mm -hmm. He's giving you gifts and callings and a pace. And that pace looks different than somebody else. Our call is to be faithful with that pace. And it's a pace to use, to use Eliza's words. It's one where we can still look around, <laughs> look around how lucky we are, how blessed we are to be alive right now. That's the, the stop and smell the roses mentality to life and leadership. And it's a healthy pace because nonstop is never sustainable. Uh, point number two, there is a fine line between passion and idolatry. 
this isn't a word that we use a lot. An idol is something that we would give, something that we would give ourselves up for in order to get, or something that we would even sin to get. I found this picture online. Let me just first say I'm very disappointed and upset to know that there are so many different flavors of Klondike bars. Yeah. Okay, I had no idea. Oh, yeah, man, that's like, awesome. like <laughs> vanilla ice cream and a chocolate outside. Like that's a Klondike bar. To me. This is a this is a whole smorgasbord of of <laughs> amazingness right here. <laughs> What's, you know, this this is where it's so funny. We, you know, as digital marketers, like we don't talk about jingles and yet from the 90s, we remember all of them. What's what's Klondike's question? Oh, what would you do, do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> <laughs> Can I, like, that's a question we could ask ourselves about anything in life. What would you do for fill in the blank? Hamilton's got a lot of passion. This is what I want. I'm not going to win my shot. This is what I'm going to do. He keeps fighting with, with George Washington. I'm not going to write for you. I want to fight. And, and George Washington keeps like, no, no, not, not right now. No. What would you do for the things that you want in your life? And I can tell you as a uh, longtime idolater, uh, that this is like really hard and super, super common. The things that we're passionate about can become idols. Anything good. Remember the first time somebody like I've been, I told you guys know, I've been worship leading for like 15 years. I remember the first time someone asked me if my ministry was an idol. I was like, like my Jesus thing is a non-Jesus thing. Like what the heck are you talking about, bro? You can't make ministry an idol. Like it's, I'm doing my thing for Jesus. And he's like, no, what are you really doing it for? Where, where, where's your heart at in what you're doing? And so I, I, one of the things I did, I went through um, the performance and I'm looking for like, where are signs where this passion became an idol that led to a lot of the failure that we're talking about? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put a couple quotes up on the screen and I'm gonna share with you some signs of idolatry like that I experienced in my life. And I think we all experience in our lives. And this is how we know, how do we know? It's a passion or is this an idol? How do we, how do we bring it back in our lives? Uh, can I just say that like Angelica's commitment to uh, Alexander, this, one of the interesting themes throughout the, the performance is Eliza, his wife, her sister is named Angelica. Angelica was actually the person who introduces Hamilton to Eliza at a party. But when Angelica introduces him, she does so somewhat reluctantly because she is very attracted to Hamilton at this, at this party. Like the, like the fifth or sixth song, there's this amazing moment where they're, they're, they're toasting the groom, like Eliza and Hamilton are getting married, and it's like, to the groom, to the groom, and then all of a sudden time stops, and they use that rotational stage to reverse, and it goes back in time, and now it's, it's the same thing that we had just seen in the previous song of Angelica meeting Hamilton introducing her to Eliza, but it's from Angelica's perspective now. It's retelling the whole story of what happened in that moment. And she's regretting, she's regretting having introduced Hamilton to Eliza because now it's cost her that relationship. But as she ends this song, she says, she sings this line, when I fantasize at night about Alexander's eyes, I romanticize what might have been. This is when things become an idol, where we fantasize what could have been. We romanticize something. We say, like, this, this could, what could have happened? And we, we wrap our, our life and our emotions and our, our thinking around what could have been in a moment. And it destroys us. It destroys us. I, I already shared this with you before, but when, when Hamilton said I hadn't slept in a week, like signs of idolatry, you can't even sleep. You won't sleep. Because this thing that you want to do, this thing that you have to do, this, this, this thing that you feel like you have to complete or compete in or blah, 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 just keeping you up at night, you can't even sleep. Sign of idolatry, fantasizing, romanticizing the past, not sleeping. Um, Al Andrew Burr, ironically, meets a woman who is married, and he's telling these friends at, at, at dinner one night, like, I really, you know, I I met this woman, they're like, oh, you should have brought him. And he's like, no, nah, it's going to be kind of difficult. And they're like, what? You should have brought her. 
And, and he says, I uh, probably can't do that. She's married. And the counsel he gets back is, if you love this woman, go get her. What are you waiting for? And then he sings this song, wait for it. And he's not willing. And he goes and, and he, he, he takes another, this, this theme of unfaithfulness, this theme of, of like adultery in marriage, like is a common one throughout. What's a sign of idolatry? You're not willing to wait for something. You're not willing to fight something that yet you know is actually bad for you. What should have been Angelica's position? What should have been Andrew Burr's position? It's like, this isn't right, so I won't do it. Talking about hard decisions that we make, that America has made. What are the hard decisions that we make? This is wrong. I won't go do it. His counsel was, go. What are you waiting for? Andrew Burr sings about Hamilton. He says that Hamilton doesn't hesitate. He exhibits no restraints. He takes and he takes and he takes. What's the sign of idolatry? We won't hesitate. No restraints in our life. Whatever I want, I go and get. That's Solomon in Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Whatever my eyes wanted, I gave it to them. That is idolatry. That is an idol of self. Later on in the performance, how do you write like tomorrow won't arrive? So he starts writing a ton, I mean, tons and tons and tons. How do you write like you need it to survive? How do you write every second you're alive? What's a sign of idolatry? Like whatever this thing is that we want, we have to have it to survive. Even Angelica says, right, I'll never be satisfied. And there's, there's kind of like this like heroism mentality when you hear her sing it for the first time, you're like, you're like, yeah, yeah. And then you realize like, wait, what does that mean? The fact that you're saying like, I'll never be satisfied. I'll never be content. Mm -hmm. I, I remember a friend of mine was like, yeah, yeah. So what's your favorite song? I was like, ah, this one, this one. It's like, what's your favorite song? He's like, never satisfied because I'm never satisfied. And I'm thinking, you want me to like praise you for that. But all you're confessing is, is that you have zero contentment in your life. This is what idolatry does. It destroys contentment. I have to have this. I must have this. I must get to this or I can't be satisfied. I can't be happy. I can't be fulfilled unless I have this thing. I have to get my plan through Congress. Hamilton tells his wife, I can't stop till I get this plan through Congress. And we look back at everything Hamilton did for this country and we're like, oh, this is so great. And so when I ask you, were the things that he sacrificed in his life worth it? The first thing we point to is everything that he produced, everything that he created. Like it has to be it's so important to our country. Could God have done that like another way to another person for another means at a different time? Like, I, you know, what's the sign of idolatry? You, you, I can't stop. I can't. I'm going down this road now. I can't stop. Sometimes you have to cut that off completely in your life. Uh, <laughs> this is a common theme, like the, the ending of patience in our life, sign of idolatry. You won't be patient. Like, I'm just going to go and get it done. It, he even sings later on in, in this great song, Hurricane. When my prayers to God were met with indifference, I picked up a pen. I wrote my own deliverance. Hmm. What's, a, what's a sign of idolatry? Like, I'll go get it done. I don't need to wait. I don't, I don't need to wait. I'm going to go get this done. And he wrote his own deliverance and it destroyed him. The Reynolds pamphlets came out of that. There's three little short books in the New Testament, first, second, and third John. Third John's only a single chapter. It's like 15, 21 verses. Literally the last verse ends with this. Little children, keep yourself from idols. If you read through the books, it's a really interesting way to end this book. It's good. Uh, for third John, only has 21 verses, only got a little bit to say. And, and the last sentence is, keep yourself from idols. Martin Luther said, our hearts are an idol factory. Like, I just think about like that assembly line, like, and they're like, no, I kill it, and it falls off the line. It's like, another one falls off the conveyor belt, like, no, we'll kill it. And they just keep falling on the conveyor. Like, that's our hearts, just constantly. What's the next idol? You know, I was having lunch with a friend yesterday, and I was asking about his walk with the Lord, and um, he's like, yeah, I just don't really have a desire right now to, I don't feel that desire to get into the scriptures, and I said, uh, if you don't have that, it's only because you filled that song with an idol. That's it. Fine line between passion and idolatry, and as leaders, we have to protect that. Here's number three. <clears throat> Our values, the things that we value in life, they drive all of our behaviors. 
all of our behaviors are driven by what we value in life. So the question at hand is, what do you value? And this is a common question for Hamilton and Burr through, through, through the whole thing. What do you value? The first time that Hamilton meets Burr, he asks this question. If you stand for nothing, Burr, what will you fall for? I think the question I have, what, what will we fall for? What will we give ourselves for? What will we sacrifice in our own lives for? What's worth us sacrificing and falling and giving ourselves up uh, for? And Eliza makes such a good example of this throughout the whole performance. She says things like this. She's talking to Andrew, uh, sorry, to, to Alexander Hamilton. And she says things like this. She's like pleading with him. Like if your wife could just share a fraction of your time. He had sacrificed all his time. I'm not willing to take a break. I'm nonstop. Come on vacation with us. I can't. I have to get my plan through Congress. And she's like, if, 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 if your wife could just share a fraction of your time, these bids, uh, comment, you know, this common refrain, I'll be there in just a minute. Save my plate for dinner. I'll come back to bed. I, I just can't. Take a break. No. Come back to bed. That would, that would be enough if you could just be here with me. Like in, in my marriage with my wife, we call these bids. This is the time where the, the spouse puts puts their hand on the spouse's leg as an indication of like, I'm here. Or like, can I show you something? Or can I tell you about my day? We put these bids out to each other. Like, here's here's me putting the bid out. Will you take it? And sometimes like, oh, not right now. I'll come back. We were denying those bids. And sometimes we're like, yeah, tell me about that. And we, we draw ourselves in and we create connection. We create relationships. For her, you know, it, Hamilton sings over her like, would you relish being a poor man's wife? Like, I have to go do this. Could you enjoy being a poor man's wife, unable to provide for your life? And she responds, I relish being your wife. Like when they meet for the first time, Hamilton sings this. He's, he's like, I ain't got a penny to my name. And she's like, I love you. I want to marry you. And then like only, I don't know how what time, years later, He's saying, like, could you really relish being a poor man's wife? And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, remember what she said before, bro? She said yes. When you said I ain't got nothing in my name. And now she's having to plead with him, like, I just want to be your wife. And he's like, no, I got to go do this. I got I to gotta go provide. I got to go. And he's destroying his life. He's destroying his marriage as a result of this. But what winds up happening, she's, this is one of the most beautiful lines in the entire, but it's probably my favorite seen in the entire production. She says, we don't need a legacy. We don't need money. If I could grant you peace of mind, if you could let me inside your heart, let me be a part of this narrative that you're writing in the story that you'll write someday. Let this moment right here be the first chapter where you decide to stay and I could be enough and we could be enough. That would be enough. And I just like wonder like, what would it, what would Hamilton's life have been like if he had just listened to his wife at that moment? How much heartache, how much suffering could have been avoided if he would have just listened to his wife in that moment, but he didn't because he valued something different. So I, I just ask you again, challenge question, like what are you valuing? If you looked at your bank account or your calendar, what would those things indicate that you're valuing? I know for, for me, it was probably the second time Shelly and I watched Hamilton. She, I think she asked me, you know, what's your favorite part or whatever? And I said, it's this part right here where Eliza sings, we don't need a legacy. We don't need money. And I told her, I was like, I just want to be on the same page in our life about that. Like, I just want that to be true for both of us, where both of us say like, we don't need these things. The things that you actually value in life, like who needs to hear that that's what you're valuing right now? Like for my wife to come and say those things to me, like that changes the way I lead. That changes the way that I make decisions in my life. What are you valuing? Because all of your behaviors in life are based on the things you sacrifice. Here's number four. Don't chase your reputation. Uh, I'm going to say reputation is a synonym for legacy here. There's a lot about reputation and legacy in Hamilton, and I love this particular theme. I have done this in my life. I have sought to chase my reputation when I felt like it was going negative. I would circle back behind people, and I would try and get in front of the stories, and chasing that is a really um, 
a really destructive thing in our lives. Almost every main character in the story has something to say about this particular idea. Burr says, uh, he's speaking of his parents, which by the way, did you, I don't know if you know this, Andrew Burr's grandfather was, anybody? Preacher. Who? Uh, oh, oh, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. One of the most famous preachers of the 17, 1800s. Does that be the time zone, right? Yeah. Super famous. He wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, one of the most one of one of the most well-known sermons oh, yeah. in all of Christian history. Jonathan Edwards was an incredible guy. If John Piper, like a guy of today, had somebody who were reading through the land journey, his number one, probably most influential person in his life was Jonathan Edwards, this was Andrew Burr's grandfather. <laughs> He's speaking of his parents, and he said that they died and left no instructions, just a legacy to pr protect. So even of his parents, he sees he came from a really, really upscale family. Like when you think about like who's who are the people on the scene who were most likely to do something with their lives, Andrew Burr would have been sitting at the top. He tried to run for president once, didn't go well. Tried to run for president a second time, also didn't go well. Got second place, which in that time meant he became the vice president. Very strange to think about that. What if our last election <laughs> or the previous elections, the person, the runner up was vice president of the United States? How would that change the way we campaigned? Like, that's a, such an interesting thought. So even, even Burr's thinking, like, I got this legacy I want to protect. But George Washington, again, he's like, he's 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 the, the wise person, right? He says, Hamilton comes up at some point and somebody said really something really negative about George Washington. And so Hamilton's like, we got to go defend you. And they wind up having a duel. Um, uh, Hamilton won't have the duel because he knows it's going to infuriate George Washington. So somebody else does it. But when it's over, Hamilton's the one who has to account for it. So he comes in, he's like, we, you know, we should have shot this guy in the mouth. That's right. And George Washington comes back and he says, I'm not a maiden in need of defending. Charles Lee, Thomas Conway, these men, this is uh, Hamilton talking, he says, Charles, Charles Lee, Thomas Conway, these men take your name and they're raking it through the mud. And Washington comes back and says, my name's been through a lot. I can take it. I love this. Hamilton's like, I got to protect your legacy. And he's like, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And Hamilton comes back and says, well, I don't have your name. <laughs> Great response. <laughs> <laughs> Hamilton says this though, like in protecting his legacy, he's like, okay, fine. When, when my legacy is under threat, when, when the Reynolds pamphlet's going out and I'm, I'm concerned about what my future's gonna be, I'll write my way out. I'll overwhelm them with honesty. This was this thinking that led him to write the, the Reynolds pamphlet. I'll just be as honest as I possibly can. I'll put everything out there and I'll protect my legacy. This is the eye of the hurricane. This is the only way, the only way I can protect my legacy. And his wife winds up saying this about him later. You and your words, obsessed with your legacy, your sentences that you're writing, they border on senseless. You're paranoid in every paragraph how they perceive you. And, and this sort of mindset, even at his leadership level, boils down to his family and his son. His son, who winds up dying, says, I shoulder my dad's legacy with pride. This guy I, he disparaged my father's legacy in front of a crowd. I can't have that. I'm making my father proud. And so when his son hears somebody else say something disparaging about his father, he challenges this man to a duel. His son, Philip Hamilton, comes to him and says, I've heard somebody say something negative about you, and I, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, make peace, and so I have to go duel this person. So Hamilton gives him his weapons, and he says, you do the honorable thing, and you aim at the sky. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and and they duel, and Philip raises his gun in the sky and gets shot in the side, and he dies uh, very shortly afterwards. And this is that moment where really bright scene where Hamilton leans over and just that lighting of and hearing his heartbeat stop. Such an amazing moment, and all out of this one primary desire: legacy, reputation has to be protected. And after all that was said and done. His, the first song reminds us, his enemies destroyed his reputation, America forgot him. Sought his whole life to protect his legacy, protect his reputation, and in the end, his enemies destroyed it, and America forgot him. Mm -hmm. I remember 
when I was being discipled by a pastor in my church, he took me out to, this was at like 5.30 a.m. This guy was nuts. Meet me at Micanopy at 5.30 a.m. At this, at this GPS coordinate, okay? <laughs> we get there, and it's a, it's a cemetery. It's going to murder you. <laughs> <laughs> it's me and another guy, so this is a witness. Okay? <laughs> my, my second. <laughs> and we're walking through this, this really creepy, eerie, sun's just coming up, fogs over the, the cemetery, and he points at, at a couple different tombstones along the way. He's like, you know this person? I'm like, no. And he's like, that man, when he died, thought all of his problems were everything in life. Within 24 hours of him dying, people began to forget who he was, and all of his problems in life faded away. A month later, people were struggled to remember his face, and a year later, people had faint memories of who he once was. And now decades later, you have no idea who he is. Then he points at this giant statue, Perry Stark, so and so. He's like, "You ever heard of this guy?" And he's like, "No." He was, and he, he said, "This is like a war guy in our in our community. That's why all these cities are named after him, Perry Stark, after this guy. You've never even heard of him." This reminder, like we, we chase our reputation, we chase, we're trying to build this legacy, and like, at, like our life is a vapor. <sighs> It's gone. That's what Ecclesiastes says when, when it talks about life being meaningless. It doesn't mean that it has no meaning. The, the word in Hebrew is it's a breath. Breath of breaths. It's gone. I love this quote. I wish, I wish this could have been Burr's legacy. He says at some point, legacy? What is legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. That's leadership. You know, building a legacy is really about in this life. It's about planting seeds in a garden that you may never get to see. I plant a seed in you. I plant a seed in her. I plant a seed in them. And I don't know what's going to become of those things, but I'm faithful to, 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 to do that in the moment, sacrificing the things that are important, not sacrificing the things that are important, sacrificing the things that I ought to be to pursue the things that are important, chasing a legacy, <laughs> just the wrong mindset. What will happen after? What's my story? be faithful. Here's number five. True humility, real humility, is best seen in us actually surrendering some things. This is completely contrasting Hamilton's viewpoint. I'm nonstop. Not going to give up my shot. Won't give up my shot. Never. Never going to back down. I, this is the one song I want us to watch together. Uh, so we're going to listen. We're going to watch this together. This is uh, called One Last Time. Uh, that he honestly, that guy's probably my favorite vocalist. Christopher Jackson. Christopher Jackson in the entire performance. His vocals are just so smooth. So on an incredible, incredible moment in the production. What, what did you guys notice? Like, tell me some things that you noticed, like across the board, anything that you noticed or took away, even as we reviewed that song in this context. I liked how Hamilton was talking. So I'm assuming Hamilton wrote that speech for uh, George Washington. So like they're both saying the same words. Oh, so good. Cool. But then I also found myself thinking about how the whole song is about legacy and how at least in this day and age, I don't necessarily consider George Washington any more prestigious than Alexander Hamilton. To me, they're both guys who lived a long time ago. One guy who did things the really wrong way and one guy who tried to do things the right way. And even still their legacies both have kind of faded. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the context of, of how long does it last? Uh, this is the this is the issue of immediacy in our day and age. Like the, only the immediate is important. Only the immediate is relevant. Um, so that's a good. I love that when when he stands out in front and then they switch positions slowly. <laughs> so good. That just that that idea of like who is actually out in front and who are the people that that we look upon. It's interesting because a lot of Hamilton is like taken inspiration from. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda enjoying the West Wing and like speechwriters are a huge part of that show and talking about their value what their actual role is how much of it is their words but really I appreciate this because while Hamilton is the one writing it and of course he feels a lot of passion towards the subject it's not the same as when Washington's speaking singing it it's you know it's so much more it's it's his it's his words it's just Hamilton's lexicon mm. being put together and mm. but it's just mm. I also think that it's interesting with Corey's point that I think the difference between the two people is that Washington saw he 
is not going to be remembered for much, you know, like, and he has maybe because of his attitude towards it and his indifference towards winning that legacy, at least in how they portray him. But I think he saw much more to the other side of like, people forget, you know, like history will see all of this, but it's not really going to see every part of us. And all we can do is really try to help them move along. Mm. I think there's also something to be said for ending on a good note, mm -hmm. which is something that's increasingly um, disliked in our society. Mm -hmm. I, get, I know that you're not much of a sports guy, but I feel like I see that more and more in the NFL where these quarterbacks, they just like, don't stop. They're like, I'm not going to stop playing football until I'm broken. Mm -hmm. And they don't leave on a good season. And often they'll come back for their last season and it's horrible. And the mm -hmm. last thing people remember about them is they're like, wow, this guy really is washed up rather than mm -hmm. like leaving when they should. TV another example. <laughs> Except Tom Brady, who's apparently just eternally the best <laughs> yeah, quarterback of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on, on that performance? Virtual okay. people as well? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I like it because I look at it a lot as like the wisdom of age. Because at that point, Washington is a great deal older than Hamilton. And Hamilton's still got that sort of young person <laughs> mentality. Like, oh, yeah. as soon as he finds out Washington's stepping down, he's like, no, like, we're going to fight this. And yeah. Washington's just very resolute. Like, he knows who he is, where he yeah. is. Um, so if Hamilton had just talked less in the beginning and sort of listened to Washington more mm -hmm. and taken advantage of that sort of wisdom of age, things might have turned out a little bit different for him. That's good. So it's interesting, Hamilton in that scene is like able to, at the end, come to terms with Washington. So it's like he gets a little bit of that, but couldn't apply it to his own life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've often felt that moment in George Washington's life was a pinnacle moment in yes. our nation's history. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like if it went the other way, it would have been a very different history mm -hmm. than the one we experienced. Mm -hmm. And you talk about planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. Like often I won't wander around when I'm on my road bike looking at these forests. And I think, who planted these? years ago i had no idea but i enjoy them i love them you know and like that's exactly what washington did we forgot we're, we haven't forgotten him but we know less and less about him as the years mm -hmm. go on but he planted he planted the forest mm -hmm. and we get to enjoy it but he was okay with that mm -hmm. you know um, his his viewpoints are so different than than hamilton's even that even as he starts let's take a break and then we'll teach them how to say goodbye. Like his surrendering of his position and, and teaching America for the first time ever that the commander in chief can surrender their position. If you look through American history, this is regarded as one of the greatest displays of statesmanship in mm -hmm. all of American history. Mm -hmm. I would say world history. It was the first yeah. time that it was a peaceful transfer of power between two different parties in a world history on record. So the entire world was that. watching Absolutely. because no one had ever done this. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, he said, if, if I say goodbye, then the nation learns to move on. Like, what a surrender of power. It outlives me when I'm gone. Like the scripture says, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree. No one shall make them afraid. They'll be safe in the nation we've made. I want to sit under my own vine and fig tree, a moment in the shade at home in this nation we've made. One last time. This is ex the exact antithesis of Eliza's song to Hamilton, where she's like, will you just come home and that will be enough? And he's saying, I want to go sit under my own vine and my own fig tree that we've made. That, that's, that part that they sing with the, with the switching of positions is actually almost directly from, they edited out a couple of cool moments, uh, his farewell letter. And the, in its entirety, well, the, the ending section that he quoted from says this, though in reviewing the incidents of my administration, I'm unconscious of intentional error. I'm nevertheless too sensible of my defects not to think it probable that I may have committed many errors. First of all, what an awesome statement of humility. I'm looking back and I'm like, I don't really see anything that big of a deal, but I know who I am. I probably made a lot of mistakes. Whatever they may be, I fervently beseech the Almighty, there's an edit out, to avert or mitigate the evils to which they may have, they may tend. 
I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will never cease to view those errors with indulgence, and that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities, mine, will be consigned to oblivion, meaning what? It won't be remembered anymore. Remember uh, Harry Potter? Oblivion! Oblivion. Oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> we forget something. That's what oblivion. Consigned to oblivion. That, that my errors will be consigned to oblivion as myself must soon be to the mansions of rest. When 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 George Washington handed in his letter of resignation, I love what you said. The world was watching. One of the greatest acts. <laughs> in fact, this is what's this, this is some cool American history for you, real quick. It was so important. Uh, that they actually began to compare George Washington and the surrender of power to somebody from ancient Roman history, uh, Cincinnatus. This is where Cincinnati gets its name from. Cincinnatus was a faithful Roman leader in uh, 400, 500 BC here. It looked like, what is this, 89 years? His father was also a faithful person. Cincinnatus, though, like he just worked on a farm. He was a farm dude, a plebeian, like in society. When I say leader, I don't mean traditional forms of leadership. I mean those forms of leadership. <laughs> you have no title, no position, and you lead with influence and faithfulness. And the man was so faithful that when Rome began to get attacked from the east and southeast, their their troops being defeated, like the defeat of the entire Roman army and government under threat. They sent a ship overseas to find Cincinnatus at his cabbage farm. And as he sees these men coming, he calls his wife to go grab his toga. He puts on his toga, the sign of, of imperialism. And he meets these men, the, these men out in front of his house. And these men invite him to become dictator of all of Rome. This is a six month temporary thing, a temporary assignment in which somebody has complete authority over all of Rome. You'll, you'll later remember Julius Caesar when he was made dictator as dictator, again, six month term, he, he, he declared himself dictator for life. So when, when, this is like all authority under heaven and earth given to you in this dictator role. I want you to remember this, this symbol here, that <clears throat> that axe looking thing. Remember that symbol here in a minute. Cincinnatus takes the army of all of Rome and in less than two weeks defeats the entire threat that is coming against Rome. He walks back to Rome, surrenders his position, and goes back to cabbage farming. What? Like all authority under heaven and earth given to this man. He does, his, he does his thing. He fulfills his calling. He fulfills his purpose for which this authority was given. Could have had another five and a half months worth of dictatorship, done a lot of cool, fun things, or destroyed people's lives in all of Rome. He hands it back and says, I, I did what I was given for this, and he walks away. So here's what's cool. Here's some cool American history. This is the Washington Monument in Maryland. What do you notice about Washington? He's handing something out. Yes, what else? Wearing a toga? He's wearing a toga. Yeah. George Washington on the Washington Monument in Maryland is wearing a toga. Oh. They compared Cincinnatus's surrendering of his dictatorship to George Washington's surrendering of his leadership role. And what he's, he's handing in his letter of resignation and he's pointing south to where he did it. Likewise, at the Washington, oh, not washing, <laughs> yeah. the Washington Monument in Virginia. Notice that 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 object in the city. Yeah, you would look at this and be like, oh, a cool statue of George Washington. That's neat. Oh, what does he have? Like a cane in his hand. That's cool. What's he standing next to? I don't know. Don't move on. <laughs> that object right there is a Roman fasces, a, fa a fasces. Uh, it's it is that that very same thing that we saw in that picture of. Cincinnatus, the, that object that they were holding, this is a Roman sign of authority. Both of these, these monuments, next time you see a statue of Washington, when, 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 like look what he has in his hand. See, that's how important this act was. 
True humility in a leader seen in his surrendering of privilege, in his surrendering of power, not taking it up like Julius Caesar did and saying, mind forever, watch. No, no, no. With me when I need it, with me when I'm called to, surrendered and given up when that time comes. Mm -hmm. That is some fantastic leadership right there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic leadership. Here's number six. Unfaithfulness, though, destroys people's lives. We've seen faithful leadership. Unfaithfulness destroys people's lives. So the Reynolds pamphlet comes out. All of Hamilton's unfaithfulness in his life and leadership and family and marriage is exposed. And um, his wife reads those things. And when his wife reads those letters, she says this. I just thought this was such an interesting line. She says, I'm, I'm rereading the letters that you used to write to me in the past when we first met. I'm searching and standing for answers in every line. What is one of our, what, what, what is one of the effects of our unfaithfulness in life? We throw the people around us into complete confusion. I remember the first time somebody in, in ministry in my life was proven unfaithful and shown to be unfaithful. Like the first thing I did was say like, what am I supposed to do with everything that I got from this person? Everything I learned from this person, like, am I just supposed to like reject it all? Because clearly this person was everything I thought that they were. Unfaithful, throws people into confusion. Well, searching through these letters, I missed something? I thought you were this person. And she says this, she says, as a result of this, you forfeit all the rights to my heart. You forfeit the place in our bed and you can sleep in your office instead. Like, that's where he wanted to be, right? Like, I'm just, I gotta stay in my office. I gotta keep doing this. I gotta, I'm nonstop. I got this passion. This going to idol. I got... And she's like, oh, yeah, you just stay there from now on. That's what you wanted. That was his other mistress. Yeah. What are, what are the, what are those things in our heart? What are, what are our mistresses that we'll give ourselves to? She continues on. She says, do you know what Angelica, her sister, you know what Angelica said when, when she read what you had done? She said, you've married an Icarus. He's flown too close to the sun. This is from ancient Greek mythology as well. Who's, who's Icarus? He's the son of some guy who built wings out of like feathers and wax and he flew too high and the sun burned the wax and the wings dissolved in midair. Mm -hmm. So he had these wings like, this is great. I get to fly wherever I want. They were made of wax. He was told not to fly too high. Icarus flew too close to the sun. The wax melted and he fell to his death. Like he fell to his own death. This is like whose lives were destroyed by Hamilton's unfaithfulness? His wife? Himself? The people around him wind up seeing it and they sing mockingly over him. I can almost see the headline. Your career is done. They start singing that over and mocking him like your whole life's been ruined like this is what it's cost and and his wife winds up singing this over him in the end she says in clearing your name you've ruined our lives mm -hmm. what is what does unfaithfulness cost us what did what did unfaithfulness wind up even even costing aaron burr the son of the grandson of jonathan edwards he winds up saying he, he sings over himself History obliterates, in every picture that it paints, it paints me, Andrew Burr, the person who killed Hamilton. It paints me as the, as, as, as the evil one. It paints me and all my mistakes. Hamilton may have been the first one to die, but I'm the one who paid for it. I survived, but I paid for it. I was too young and blind. There's that, that theme as well to see. I should have known that the world was wide enough for both Hamilton and me. This line kind of makes it seem like Andrew Burr, like, Maybe he was this great guy who just really made a bad mistake, but the rest of his, like all of the stuff before this, like I don't stand for anything. People won't know what I actually care about in life. He winds up fleeing basically for his life. And the history that I've heard about his life after this is, is very scandalous. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm not sure the extent to which he was, he basically winds up being accused for treason because he took up a group of men, went down the Mississippi, and was about to cause a bunch of these regions to secess from the United States and basically become his own. 
He winds up reaching out to France and overseas, like seeing if they'll support him in this taking of this, this land and territory and like basically building his own country. Hmm. Unfaithfulness. I, I remember the, the, the first time a pastor in my life, he asked me like in my own life and leadership, what would unfaithfulness cost you, Brandon? And he had me take out an, an index card. <laughs> And this is just him and I, one on one, to get an index card. And he just asked me this one thing unfaithfulness could be in any area of our life and leadership. Could be in the way we use our finances, could be the way that we use our influence, our ministry platforms, our time, talent, treasure. All those things are in question when it comes to faithfulness or unfaithfulness in our leadership. But he asked me this one question. He just said, In your marriage alone, the context of, of this unfaithfulness here, he said, In the context of your marriage, what would unfaithfulness in your marriage cost you? And I want you to write everything down on this index card. I just started writing it out. If I'm unfaithful to my life, I lose my ministry position. I lose my discipleship group. I lose my small group. I lose this. And, and just writing this long list down. And he's like, let that compel you. That this is what it would cost. Unfaithfulness destroys people's lives, throws people into confusion. But it's cool because there were faithful leaders in, in Hamilton as well. Uh, and one of them actually was his wife. So here's the final point. Nothing rewrites a narrative like forgiveness. <laughs> Nothing rewrites a narrative like forgiveness. You're going down this road and all of a sudden forgiveness paints a whole new road you've never seen before and you get to, to turn. So she winds up being what my wife would consider the hero of actually this entire production. Hamilton's wife, my wife is like, she is the hero of this entire story. Mm -hmm. She comes back and she sings this. Uh, they're, she's, they're walking down this garden room together. And uh, it's funny how much this has become a meme over the past few, few months because this is such a powerful moment in the production. Um, there's this chorus singing over Hamilton and his wife walking through the garden. They say there are moments that the word that words don't reach. There's a grace too powerful mm -hmm. to name. I love that phrase, a grace too powerful to name. We push away what we can never understand. We push away the unimaginable. They are standing in the garden, Alexander by Eliza's side. She takes his, his hand. It's quiet uptown. Forgiveness, can you imagine? And it is such an emotional mm -hmm. part in the production uh, where they just sing over, over them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And her, she's willing to come back after she's like, like sung at him, like, I hope you burn. <laughs> she's going to come back, seek forgiveness. Um, I can, she continues on later at the, at the end of the production. She's forgiven him so far. This is what blows my mind. She says, I put myself back into the narrative for like, for a while. There's like not a lot that Eliza said for this long period of time. She's basically in the dark recovering from how tra traumatic and emotional his unfaithfulness was. She says, I put myself back into the narrative though. I live another 50 years after Hamilton dies. It's not enough. I interview every soldier who fought by your side. And then those soldiers sing over her. She tells our story. Like she, she goes and she starts telling everybody else's story in her faithful forgiveness. I try to make sense of your thousands of pages, right? She starts reviewing like her unfaithful husband. She starts going through all everything that he writes and putting it out. A lot of what we know about Hamilton comes from the work that she did to collect and document all of that. She says, I raise funds in DC for the Washington Monument and George Shinsh. She tells my story. She, like now she's telling George's story. She said, I speak out against slavery. You could have done so much more if you'd only had time. And when my time is up, have I done enough? And then it ends with this. She says, can I show you what I'm most proud of? I established the first private orphanage in New York City, and I helped to raise hundreds of children, and I get to see them grow up. In their eyes, I see you, Alexander. I see you every time. When my time is up, have I done enough? Will they tell my story? The orphan kid mm -hmm. dies at the hands of Andrew Burr to see his wife that he was unfaithful to tell his story. And she starts, of all things, an orphanage. 
<laughs> where other orphans now come and find life and hope and healing. Uh, amazing, amazing story of faithfulness and, and faithful forgiveness as well, forgiveness. And I love last year, just that question that we got asked at GLS, you know, like, who do we need to extend forgiveness to? Because the only person who suffers from our unforgiveness is us. I've shared with you guys before that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping that the other person will die. I'm going to drink this poison because I want you to die because I can't forgive you. We're the ones who suffer from unforgiveness. A faithful leader will surrender. Privilege will surrender. Hurt. And we can go and we can reconcile with those. And in the end, this is the main question of Hamilton, right? When we're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? And they say, you have no control over who lives, who dies, who tells your story. So what's the call in the end? Be faithful in our leadership. Uh, to look out for places that unforgiveness is creeping in or the, the, the desire for privilege and authority and not being willing to surrender that and idol passion that turns into idolatry. Um, I, as I told you before, there is a million other lessons that we could have spoken about from Hamilton. Such a cool production. I had such a blast uh, putting this together. It felt like a giant thesis paper uh, that I had to write. Um, but that's what I have to share, guys. Mm, thank you.